Welcome to School of the Bible. School of the Bible, as we're teaching it here at Video Church, is taking 15 verses and going through the Bible in 15 minutes. Or, as we say, whatever book it is, we'll take 15 verses and in 15 minutes go through that to apply what the Spirit of God might be teaching you and I to appropriate for our lives, for our jobs, for our wives, for our children, for our very living and existence, because God speaks audibly, but he also speaks individually, and he speaks personally. And he does speak at times through pastors, through preachers, through apostles. In the latter days, he's spoken more directly through his son, Jesus Christ, but also because Jesus sent the Spirit of God, we can hear from God as Jesus prayed that his disciples would, even as he did. And nightly, we know that Jesus prayed and talked to his Father. So the next day, more than likely, God had laid out the plan for what the day was for Jesus to do, because he said he only did those things that were pleasing to his Father. So we, likewise, in some ways, take the Bible as a book. It's just a book. But when it is applying the Holy Spirit to it, it becomes the inerrant Word of God if, it is, in fact, read by the Spirit of God to you by you hearing it from the Spirit of God telling you. So, don't think that I'm teaching you anything that you don't already know, but rather you're learning it from the Spirit of God teaching you and the way you should go. We're now in Samuel 15.15, and the reason why we call it Samuel or 1 Samuel 15.15, or the first book of the Kings, is because it's Samuel and it's 15 verses in 15 minutes. And looking at the clock, you know, we've got our timer. Click, let's go. <laughs> but seriously, in reading these in 15 minutes, we want you to understand that God meets you as a man. Jesus comes to you by his own deity being in the Father and of the Spirit to you by presenting himself as the Savior of the world. But he will come eventually and be the King of kings and Lord of lords, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. So in the volume of the book, when Jesus spoke, he said, look, you search it, but this is what speaks of me. So that's why we look to see what God may say to us today as we read through the first 15 verses of Samuel in Samuel 15, 15, School of the Bible. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Joram, the son of Eliu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. Ephrathite. Oh well. But he had two wives. Oh, and he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the sons, two sons of Eli, Ophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters, portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her, provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband to her, Hannah, Why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thy handmaid and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it shall come to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli, 
marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, Oh no, my lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. We start off Samuel with his history. It's going to increase in knowledge of what Samuel is, how Samuel was raised, what Samuel becomes, and the book of Samuel will literally speak of Samuel, the prophet of God that will anoint eventually the first king, and that's why this is called the first book of the kings, because there will be eventually a government or a kingdom that is set up that has a king over the children of Israel. Up until this time, there had been no one in charge except for judges that were appointed to be, as we were already reading in previously in Joshua, that there had been the captains of armies that were over a certain amount of people, and they were set up also as judges. And then at different times, there were certain men of God that were called forward that were used as judges in order to rule the children of Israel because tribal matters were decided by smaller groups, larger groups, and larger groups that were 10 and 50 and 100 and so on. And a lot of times we don't understand that kind of mentality. We don't understand that in the desert, when you're living in the desert, when you're in a land that has desert climate, even if there are forests and there are trees and there are rivers, it's still a desert climate in the Mediterranean that you have to get along. In other words, if you're of a tribe, your tribe sticks together. It's not that blood is thicker than water, but it's just that you have a different mindset, a different mentality, a different way of looking at things and appreciating things. And when you're agrarian, when you're more of a farmer or a gatherer or some type of cattleman, you don't think of it the same way that you might think of it when you're sitting in a house and earning a living by going to a job. So a lot of times you have to compare things to the way they are at the time and then apply it to ourselves as we live in this time in our generation according to the way our society exists. Now, we find, interestingly enough, that the temple isn't in Jerusalem. God's house is not literally in Jerusalem, but is in Shiloh. Now, it doesn't imply, or it doesn't say that the <laughs> in this portion, it doesn't specifically say that Jerusalem doesn't have, or Jerusalem isn't made unto, because David hasn't come yet, and they haven't decided to put the house from Shiloh into Jerusalem. But we're going to see that God doesn't exist only in one place. A lot of people like today to move the embassy from Jerusalem or from, um, oh boy, from, <laughs> my mind went, zoom. as soon as I went to modern times, I couldn't think because I was still thinking in Old Testament times. Um, from, uh, boy, it's a liberal town. That's what I remember about it. You know, went there and visited once when I lived in Israel. But anyways, they want to move the embassy from where it's at in Israel to Jerusalem. Well, God's temple was originally at Shiloh. And there's a lot of reasons behind it. You can study that with Abraham and discover the, per per the perspective of there being sacrifices offered there and what's going to happen in order for there not to be the temple kept in Shiloh anymore because of the wars. But... What I find interesting is that Shiloh got honored. Shiloh was a place where peace, factually, was being made manifest by God answering prayers to those priests that were offering up sacrifices there in the tabernacle or the house of God or the tent of meeting as it was occurring there in Shiloh, not Jerusalem. Sometimes people get carried away about some of the places they want to worship as opposed to where they can worship. It doesn't matter that the fact is God is going to answer this woman where she's at, but the reality is she he knows everything of where you're at. 
You don't have to be in Shiloh. You don't have to be in Jerusalem. You can be where you are today, and God will answer you and meet you where you're at with your own issues. But I find this interesting, too, is that here we have a woman who is frustrated. She's been given a lot of encouragement. Her husband loves her. She is obviously encouraged by a double portion or more of a blessing that he's given to her than the woman who does have children. But yet she's still not content. She still wants more. She's not satisfied with her lot, but she's willing to commit it to God and make a vow that she's willing to keep. And we'll see she keeps her vow. And that vow is that she wants to have a son. Now, I can't speak for women. I can speak for myself. I have no children. The Bible says he that has no children has more children than those that do have children. And I find that that's true in my life that many people that I have ministered to and administer from the Lord are in fact a lot like children for me and that I am blessed by them and they encourage me and I love them and I minister to them and I'm, you know, a father to some or to many, as the case may be. But I can't speak to what a woman feels when she doesn't have a child. Um, some words used to be in the Old Testament, or not in the Old Testament, but in the old days, a spinster. Um, society would have looked at Hannah as being a cursed woman. Whether she's cursed or not, whether it's just medical, whether it's spiritual, we know that something is going on because the harassment happens. But it's mentioned in such a way that you wonder, is it all from the other woman or is part of it from Hannah herself? Because I think that we'll find that... <coughs> In reality, a lot of what we imagine, we created. In other words, we make it worse on ourselves by thinking about it to ourselves. And that apparently is what's going to happen and occur here with Hannah. As she is now confronted, as she's praying to the Lord, a priest comes up. Ellie. Now, we don't know if Ellie was wonderfully anointed of God, you know, to be the priest of God or whether he was kind of, you know, like a little bit, you know, off tangent at times, because his sons, obviously, were finding out later on, weren't exactly, you know, quote unquote, the sons of a priest, kind of like PK kids. We're going to find out later that Ellie's sons aren't following the Lord quite as devoutly as they should be, or in fact, have left the Lord completely. And sometimes PK kids are like that. Sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. PK kids means pastor's kids. Um... Preacher's kids the same way, minister's kids the same way. We're told that we can have an assurance that if we would train up a child in the way that they should go, that when they're old, they will not depart, that they should come back. More than likely, they will come back and, you know, serve the Lord. Elvis Presley, you know, was raised in some kind of religious background, but obviously by his lifestyle, he didn't come back to the Lord. Katy Perry is someone who's raised very devoutly, and, you know, God knows she has at times in her lyrics... Lots of things that remind us that she has an upbringing, that we would pray that she would come back to the Lord. Whitney Houston sang in a choir, but given her lifestyle choices, it's questionable whether or not she's in heaven or not. You know, I can't say one way or the other by her words or her actions, but with Elvis, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Um, Michael Jackson, obviously not a Christian and obviously not in heaven. So... A lot of what we see in here in the scriptures are going to reveal certain characteristics that we need to address to ourselves. Are we willing to give up what we want, most of all in life, to the Lord? Are we willing to commit what's greatest in our mind that we think we really want and give it to God without reservation and let it go? That great movie that's out that says, let it go, let it go, has a very powerful message to it, in a way. Let it go. Because if you can't let it go, don't make the vow. But if you're going to make a vow to the Lord, fulfill your vow, even if it costs you dearly. I think that Hannah will be proud of her son, but she will miss him desperately in many ways. I think that God allows her a certain amount of comfort and a certain amount of fulfillment and that there's a huge blessing upon 
her son's life eventually when God fulfills the promise to her. But the point I want to get to today is that do you make vows? Do you make contracts? Do you agree to something? Do you say yes? Because if you say yes, then do it. If you say no, then don't do it, but don't be more than yes or no. Don't make vows, as Jesus said, because God holds you to your vow. You'll live out that vow one way or another. Don't make oaths. Don't say, I pledge of allegiance, because that's a vow. Jesus said, don't do it. You're going to live it out. You'll be stuck in America, maybe after the rapture. Not that many are going during that time period. Don't make vows when you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Of you. you aren't, because as soon as that guy gets in front of you, he'll probably make you lie in some way, because you'll be embarrassed. So don't make vows. Don't make pledges. Don't do those things that you are extending something you can't control, because making a vow, you might not keep it. Fortunately, we do see a woman who does, but at what cost and what expense? God would rather have us don't vow unless we can live up to our vows. So when we do make a vow, if we make it, you keep it no matter what. If, and in fact, you have called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, and you have made a vow to Jesus in some way to follow him all the days of your life, do it. Do it. Do it. There'll be somebody praying for you. Maybe your mother's praying for you, your grandmother or somebody else. But if you have been making a vows willy-nilly and all around the town, guess what? Your life is probably a nightmare and a mess. We can see how Donald Trump has made contract negotiations and have failed them and have ducked them and run away from them by just declaring bankruptcy and walking away and making more money in bankruptcy by using and abusing the system that was never meant to be used that way. So if you make a vow, if you make a contract, if you say your yes is yes and your no is no, then keep it as unto the Lord. Because that's what the point of these 15 verses are for us. We must keep our word. We must be men of our word, women of our word. We must, if we say, till death do us part when we get married, then stay married. If you get divorced, then ask God to forgive you and then go get married and stay married. In other words, keep your vow. Don't negotiate. Don't appropriate. Don't negate. Don't compromise. Just don't do it in the first place and you'll be fine, as Jesus said. But if you do it, then keep it. Because God will require of you your vow. So I would say today, while you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation, but listen to what God is saying through these verses in Samuel, verses 1 through 15 of chapter 1, that when you make a vow, keep that vow, because God will be the one who keeps it for you. And you might not want the consequences of the penalties that are involved in making vows that God is holding you accountable for.